All right, everybody. This is DBase with the Mormon News Roundup. I'm here with uh, Mormonish podcasting legends Rebecca Biblioteca and Landon Brophy. Rebecca, how you doing? I am doing great. I am wearing appropriate church clothes, right like this, just for the uh, broadcast. Well, that is very special. Landon, how's it going? Oh, I had to find a suit, and it doesn't really fit my neck. It's been a couple years, but uh, I was able to get the tie on, and so we're ready to go. I I, I got to just, sorry. I'm sorry. Whoa, hey, whoa, this is a, this is a, this is a PG-13 rated podcast. <laughs> I'm not taking anything else off. It was just that, the sleeves. I had to, yeah, my shawl, my pajmina. I had to remove it. Now I feel more like myself. Well, this is the most important time of the year, which is the general conference time frame, guys. Have you been watching the general conference this weekend? And how? <laughs> yes, too much of it. <laughs> Fabulous. We're going to give you expert commentary and reactions to go along with general conference weekend this week. We've got all of the expert commentary. We're going to give you a deep dive into absolutely everything that happens, starting with general conference pre-hype here. What is our agenda? What are we going to be talking about? This is going to be a collaboration between the two of us. And first, let's talk about the predictions. And uh, Landon, what were the predictions from Mike over at LDS Discussions for this general conference? Let's see how accurate he was. Okay, let's see. He said, nothing substantial will be announced outside a bunch of temples. Same as usual. I would uh, give that a, a that's, that's a check. <laughs> Uh, the male leaders will use one of the few women speakers to take a shot at Mormon women who don't wear church required underwear with Masonic symbols 24 seven bingo. Yep. <laughs> very accurate. That is almost prophetic. That's a very good summarization. That's your pre summarization. But Rebecca, for those out there who don't know what exactly is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at semi-annual general conference. Oh, to explain what that is, yes, twice a year, semi-annually, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a conference where all of its upper leadership, the Quorum of the Twelve, the First Presidency, and some of the 70s, they all give talks on different topics that are interesting to the Mormon world, and also they give instruction, right? That's the most important part. So, And as I predicted, they would use the word covenant, covenant path, think celestial, Children of the Covenant over and over again. I've been keeping a runny tally. I think I was pretty accurate on that prediction. Very nice. Okay, well, let's see what we've got on tap here for sure. Uh, the LDS uh, General Conference is a special place where some old guys come together to recite the same 50-year-old ideas over and over again, as in many different ways as possible, all while acting like these ideas are somehow new and original. Is that a pretty good summary as well? I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you nailed it. it. It's just amazing how every year you watch it and you're expecting something will change and it's right. just the same thing over and over again. It's so mind-numbingly the same. But we're going to make it interesting for you. This is not going to be anything like the same for sure. But I think the general conference time, guys, it's the most wonderful time of the year. What is this? Children of the corn? What is that? I say children of the co oh, covenant, not corn, oh. but covenant. It's very similar. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually watched that. I understand it's a cult yeah. classic. It's a cult classic. It is, yep, yeah. It sure is. Seems very appropriate at this particular moment, by the way. Uh, let's keep it. Let's keep this truck going. So pre-conference hype here. You know, just before conference started, guys, President Nelson told everyone, your leaders are getting old and it's going to show this weekend. Um, and yeah, there's some really old prophets there. The one on the left, what is that? Joseph Fielding Smith. Um, I, I don't know all my prophets, guys. I, I'm not sure if that's <laughs> Joseph Fielding Smith. And on the right, is that is that President Benson? I, I don't know. I can't keep them all straight. There's some really old prophets out there, though, isn't there? Yeah. And, and don't forget that once you're an old prophet, um, your words are really not valid anymore. Much like unlike vintage comic books and classic cars. We have been told that before. Yes, we, indeed we have. So uh, let's just watch a quick news uh, clip on how old these prophets really are, because that really dominated quite a bit of what we were talking about. We're going to come back to this time and time again. Let's see how old these guys are. It's crazy. The prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says some church leaders may pre-record their general conference talks or give them while sitting down. President Russell M. Nelson made that announcement on X today. He tied the announcement to his upcoming 100th birthday, saying he cherishes his long life serving the Lord, but also needs to take care of his body. Some people planning to go to conference this weekend tell us this doesn't change a thing for them. 
We've already had President Nelson and um, that's the Elder Holland and uh, it seems like there's somebody else that has done it in the last few years that way. It doesn't make any difference. Making accommodations, like allowing them to be pre-recorded and seated, you know, um, is uh, a good, you know, a good way to be inclusive. Well, President Nelson did not say if he plans to pre-record his talk. He was unable to go to the church's last October general conference in person because of a back injury. You might remember that. The last we heard of the prophet's health, he had begun attending in-person meetings again in mid-November. You Okay, guys, so we're talking about some really old prophets. They're so old that they have to give a disclaimer in advance that says, don't be afraid of what you see. Yes, we really are this old. I mean, it's it's stunning. It was a little concerning and there was a picture that kind of came out where they showed several of them in wheelchairs being wheeled again in and again that's fine but i like wondered Jesus. yeah i wondered if maybe there might be some kind of announcement about some kind of new emeritus option i wondered if this new story was sort of preparatory to that but no not at all so we had some recordings we definitely had pull away of the camera when people were being either wheeled or propped up to the pulpit because they didn't want that look. Um, so you would just sort of, boop, there they are. We don't know how they got there. So yeah, they, they still tried to make it look like they were in control and in command and leadership. Yes, they tried to, uh, as I say, put lipstick on a pig, but it's tough because this first presidency is older than any other first presidency ever. The yep. top four men are all over their 90s, and they're really all pushing a very high age. I put together a quick video that goes along with this, The Dilemma of Aging Prophets, a Mormon Church Conundrum. It's a two-minute clip here where I go through and show the last recorded conference address of various church leaders, and you're going to see how old these folks really are. But honestly, it's nothing in comparison to what we saw at this general right. conference. Pay attention to what you see in this clip from Thomas Monson, Gordon B. Hinckley, Howard Hunter. It's just so incredibly old. And it's just, I, it's really stunning. Let's, let's play this for you and get your reaction to this one. Have you ever contemplated the pivotal role of a prophet in a religious institution? How their divine guidance shapes the beliefs, practices, and future direction of a faith community? Today, we embark on a journey to understand this critical role, particularly within the context of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon Church. In the Mormon Church, the position of the prophet holds significant weight. This individual, known as the prophet, seer, and revelator, is seen as the sole conduit of divine communication. They guide the church's members, direct its affairs, and provide spiritual leadership. However, this lifetime position has not been without its challenges and controversies. Consider the cases of Ezra Taft Benson and Thomas S. Monson, two notable leaders of the Mormon Church. As they advanced in age, they faced health challenges that started affecting their effectiveness as leaders. Monson's battle with Alzheimer's disease, for instance, led to public incidents of confusion and shortened speeches before his passing in 2018. Criticism arose over the church's handling of aging prophets. Voices within the church and outside began to question if a retirement system should be implemented for the prophets to ensure the church's continuity. This issue was further complicated by the excommunication of dissenting voices like D. Michael Quinn and Lavina Fielding Anderson, which highlighted existing tensions within the church. The question of an incapacitated prophet being the sole conduit of divine communication posed a significant challenge. It raised questions about leadership succession and the church's future direction. So, what have we learned today? The role of a prophet in a religious institution, such as the Mormon Church, is undoubtedly crucial. They offer guidance and direction for their community. However, when faced with health challenges or aging, the effectiveness of these prophets can be compromised leading to questions about leadership succession and the future course of the church. Moreover, the handling of these situations can lead to tensions within the community, highlighting the need for open dialogue and perhaps a reconsideration of existing practices. As we reflect on these issues, it's clear that the role of a prophet extends far beyond spiritual guidance. It encompasses leadership, continuity, and the very future of the institution they lead. It's a role of immense responsibility, one that requires our understanding and thoughtful consideration. 
I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. So, Landon, what happens with the prophet, the sole vicar of Jehovah, God's only representative on earth, is too old to act and nor and can't even receive revelation, is in dementia or is drooling in his journal conference chair? Well, I think it leaves a power vacuum. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think we have that with... Uh with Russell Nelson right now, he seems somewhat with it. But uh, in the case of Monson, where we had a complete loss of his ability to lead, it leaves you wondering who actually is running the, the church. Is it members of the First Presidency? Is it the senior member of the Quorum of the Twelve? Is it the Quorum as a whole? Who, who's running it? Who's making these decisions? And I think we actually got uh, what looked like almost a, a takeover uh, when we had the November 15th policy mm -hmm where this policy got pushed through somehow and then got pulled back uh, after after they died and the person who pushed it through then was able to blame the previous guy uh, for the policy. So uh, yeah, definitely leaves a power vacuum there uh, as to who's in charge and who's making the decisions. It certainly does. And we're seeing um, some interesting pictures that are coming out of this general conference relative to the very aging prophets that we have. For instance, here's a picture of uh, here's a picture of the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Jeff Holland. And uh, can I get you to read that, uh, Rebecca, and give your reaction to this particular photo? I cannot read that. It is too small on my screen, which is like this. Landon, why don't you read it and I'll react. Okay. Um, I'm going to be honest here. It's uh, sick to me how the church basically forces these older men who would otherwise be retired and spending time with their family in their last years focusing on their health to keep doing the Lord's work. No, no, no. Holland should be retired. Yeah, I think a lot of us feel that way when we see these pictures. And I think back to Ezra Taft Benson. This is one of the first times when we kind of got an inkling of this. So he was completely incapacitated for quite a while. And we were always getting messages. He loves you. He's thinking about you. He's sending his wishes to you, to the membership. And then one of his grandsons stepped forward and said, he's not, he's completely incapacitated. He doesn't even know who he is or anything, which of course, age related, right? That's nothing new. And that was the first time I think that the membership went, oh my goodness, you know, what do we do when somebody is incapacitated from the top? We had Thomas Monson, where now in the world of the internet and social media, we have people coming out and saying, do you know what he does all day? He likes to drink root beer floats and he likes to watch the movie, What About Bob? That is what he's doing. So these are the messages that we're getting about our leaders. And it definitely makes you start to have this empathy for these older men that, you know, they should be with family. They should be in a more relaxed environment. They shouldn't have this pressure, but there's no mechanism right now for that to happen. And as Landon said, this power vacuum is real. You see this in corporations, they would never let this happen where the man at the top is not, or woman is not in complete control. And you have this infighting and these agendas being pushed by people in the 12. And I think we've seen examples of policies and things that have happened when someone else is steering the ship. It's not the figurehead. That person is incapacitated. Yeah, President Benson was in serious mental decline for some time. Yeah. But don't forget, the first modern apostle who had mental incapacitation was actually President McKay for approximately a period of eight years. And he actually called five additional counselors mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. late 60s mm -hmm. in order to help him run the church because he was completely out of it. And that led to issues with the race and the priesthood ban. Yep. It led to issues with the church being insolvent by building yep. too many buildings. It led to many, many problems. And we're seeing potentially something similar to that happening. Let's also talk about some of the other pre-conference hype here. And this is from one of my uh, favorite uh, uh, folks out there, Okapanji Elva Sunday. He said, hey, Satan is going to be offended today. And ex-Mormon Thanos kind of tweeted back that says, you know, why is it that gods and demigods get so easily offended out there? It's just amazing <laughs> that they can't quite keep it together. You ever notice that? Especially since we're just little human beings. I mean, really, what can we do to them? But apparently everything we do is very, very important. Indeed it is. Or how about this one? It's Conference Eve. Make sure to think celestial as you fall asleep tonight. So President Nelson will leave you many crushed water bottles and vitamin pills under your pillow. Landon, what is President Nelson, the tooth fairy now? Boy, these are some of the recurring themes that we see over and over. And boy, this... Uh... Uh, so think celestial, just, uh, I was so sick of hearing that <laughs> during the conference. Yeah. It was like everyone had to get that word in their talk uh, to show how uh, how much they supported President Nelson.
Yeah, definitely. Uh, and we heard President Nelson double down on that in his final address, which we'll cover in a moment. And once again, I guess it's the greatest manifestation of the Savior's power that we've ever seen. It's all coming to fruition so long as you eat your vitamins, think celestial, and don't forget, never take counsel from those who don't believe in Russell Marion Nelson Sr. A uh, couple of other, this is all pre-conference here. You know, this Mormons during general conference, they're not paying attention, but Exmos during general conference, write that down, write that down, write that down. Rebecca, why is it that Exmos seem to be paying more attention than Mormons? I don't know exactly, but it's definitely a phenomenon. My faithful family was really shocked when I was able to read the lineup for each session. They couldn't believe it. And of course, that's Nemo, right? He put that out there. But I think we're just on guard. We've seen so many things before. We want to know what we need to look for. Of course, we're always still looking for content for podcasts, but we definitely, that cartoon is not wrong. We've got our binoculars and we are watching just to see what might be said, looking for positive changes, looking for positive talks, but also looking for things that might be harmful to any kind of marginalized group that we can sort of help circumvent there. Yeah, absolutely. And you got the uh, Latter-day Saints there drinking the Kool-Aid very <laughs> deeply in those pictures. I love these AI picks for sure. And we have the general conference guess who board out there. You know, you play the guess who board game where you try to figure out who somebody is. And I just thought I'd run that through with you guys here. This is with all of the general authorities and general officers of the church. I want to play a quick game of guess who. This is all precursor stuff here, but this is very important stuff here. And I'm going to guess it and see if you can figure out who I'm talking about. Let's let's start with number one. Signed up on shocking gay BYU students' genitals. Which one are you going to fold down on there? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, Oaks, oh. President Oaks. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know your stuff. Or how about this? Probably masterminded the entire shameful Enzyme Peak Advisors debacle. Mm. What do you think? Uh, uh, Irene? Would that, that be yeah. Irene? That was my guess, yep. yeah. yeah. Irene came into the first presidency right before EPA was founded. Yeah. He's the Harvard business professor, and he's remained in there the entire time. I think he is the mastermind, so you'd have to fold him down in the Guess Who game. Or how about this? Has a history of telling exaggerated stories to make himself look <laughs> prophetic. Well, that could be all of them. I... <laughs> President Nelson, we'll go I with Russell Nelson on that one. <laughs> yeah, you may have to fold down most of them. Yeah. yeah. But definitely President Nelson for sure. Or how about this one? Headlines, $250 per plate, apostolic fundraising dinners. I know you guys know a thing or two about that. That would be Elder Raz Band. Raz right? Band, yeah. yeah, we, yeah to go we, were, with him. yeah. we almost got to go until we were uninvited twice. So. I really like this Guess Who game. I think it's going to catch on. Or how about this one? Didn't leave his net to follow the Lord. Instead, he wanted to cash in on some juicy stock options while still collecting his modest apostolic stipend. Hmm. Is that Ballard? No, it's the guy. It uh, I, I can't remember his name. He owns the. He, he runs the exercise company up in Logan. Uh, I fit Stevenson. He, yeah, he Stevenson. Didn't, yeah, he didn't leave his net and follow the Lord. And finally, here's a last one here. This white and delightsome. That's all of them. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna, <laughs> unless it's Elder Suarez uh, or Elder Gong, you're gonna have to put them all down. But this is a fun game for sure. Um, and what about the headlines coming into this general conference, uh, Rebecca? What kind of headlines did we see here? Well, there was definitely a lot of hype. This one said millions to watch global Latter-day Saint general conference this weekend. Although I had people um, tweeting to me or texting to me and saying, have you looked at the numbers on conference? It's not that high as far as who's watching it on YouTube. So maybe they're accessing it through another avenue. I don't know. Possibly. But then when you look at the global religions here, Landon, this is, uh, you know, got Christians yeah. on the left and Muslims in the middle. And then you have uh, Hindus on the right there, Roman Catholics of 1.4 billion, uh, Islam almost 2 billion, Hindus and Buddhists another billion. And when you look at all the little Christian denominations, you can finally get down here. And the fourth smallest one on this list from the millions and millions is Latter-day Saints. You have to see a magnifying glass to be able to figure them out. It's pretty darn small, Landon. And I think you could even step it down lower than that because uh, we know how the church keeps count of its numbers compared to someone like Jehovah Witnesses and the others who include actually butts in the seats, not just people who they've been able to convince to go under the water. Absolutely. Yep. And I would say on that, that, you know, people will say, oh, some of these religions have been around so much longer compared to the burned over district religions. Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventists. Mormons are not in first place. Those other religions are bigger than the Church of Jesus Christ. 
Yeah, absolutely, for sure. In fact, Rebecca, you were talking about how Latter-day Saint General Conference wasn't trending this week. And I pulled this off of Twitter. Can you read this for us yes, about the trending that. nature and give us your reaction? <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's trending this time, Rebecca. I know. It, said, it is weird that General Conference isn't trending on Twitter. And none of my family and friends have posted a single thing about it on any of their socials. It feels different this year. And anecdotally, I can tell you I was with Faithful Family over the weekend. And I was the one that said aren't we going to turn on conference? Because of course I'm looking for podcasting material. And they said, Oh, you know, I think we're going to do lunch and then we'll come back or we'll just catch it later or we'll listen to it fast. So those days of being glued to the television now for five sessions, I don't know if that's necessarily happening. And also anecdotally, and I'm in the heart of the heart of Utah County stores were packed. Restaurants were packed all during conference hours. So just as far as what I'm observing, it doesn't seem to have that shut down everything and watch conference effect that it's had in prior years. Yeah, for sure. And let's go ahead and hop in. That's in a precursor here to the actual Saturday morning session. And this is a little bit different here this guy, this time, guys, because they did the sustainings mm -hmm. on Saturday morning. Landon, why do you think they switched things up and did the sustaining votes on Saturday? You know, I, I was trying to figure out if they were trying. They not only did the sustainings, but they did the record. The auditor guy stood up first, and I caught that right off the bat. I said, isn't this usually the second session that they do this? And I don't know if this is a way they're trying to look more transparent. Let's put it up front, even though he's going to say exactly the same thing he's always said. Uh, we'll do it up front. But uh, uh, And also, uh, we have a new apostle who has not been... Uh, uh, sustained yet, mm -hmm. and maybe they wanted to get that out of the way before you spoke. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, they or maybe they were trying to put the kibosh on people voting opposed by yep. switching it up so you didn't know where it was going to take place. Yep. There's a lot of cabal, a lot of conspiracy theories. Don't know for sure exactly the reason behind that. But if you think about the sustaining vote here, you have the people on the left getting sustained. And here's all of the new general officers, general authorities of the church here that are filing up onto the stand into the coveted red velvet chair, high back purchase. I got this tweet here from X that says, after all the talk about LDS women and priesthood authority that we supposedly have, it's an interesting contrast to begin general conference by reading a long list of names of male general authorities. No LDS women is honored with the title of general authority. It's mostly men right off the bat, isn't it, Rebecca? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think that is another reason they put the sustaining. I think that the first session on Saturday is the one that you wake up and go, oh, yeah, that's on. So I don't think you really watch it. And ever since somebody hid the pieces of a megaphone in the various bathrooms of the conference center, assembled that megaphone and then voted no really loudly, they're just trying to keep it more low key. Yep, they probably are. And you talked about the auditing report there, Landon, for sure. And uh, did we get anything from the auditing report? Did they bring up the numbers? Did they tell us the ins and the outs, the X's and the O's, the red and the black? Did they let us know anything? Or was this just a standard uh, church-issued auditing report? Absolutely stock report. It was read right directly the same as every other report. And of course, when we had the EPA fines of $10 million, we got the exact same report. So I don't know what we're supposed to take from this report, because we know that even when they're not in accordance with uh, the law, even they're not going to bring it up in conference. Yeah. Now we're not going to cover every single uh, of the speakers here on this uh, particular general conference. We don't have time for that, but some of the major ones we are definitely going to highlight, including Annette Dennis here, mm -hmm. which was basically the first major speaker of, after the sustainings, after the auditing report. And this is on the heels here of her incredibly controversial remarks, which she gave at the 182nd General Relief Society President's, uh, 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 the 182nd Relief Society commemoration, in which she said, there is no other religious organization in the world that I know of that has so broadly given power and authority to women. It was interesting to me that they were bringing her out as the very first speaker. What do you think, Rebecca? Mm, I think we all knew there would be a talk about garments, but I didn't really put that together that they would literally have her give it because the memes were everywhere about really we have the most power of any other organization in the world yet somebody's telling me what kind of underwear I can wear. I mean the juxtaposition there it was you just couldn't not make a meme about it. So it was very interesting that she was the one to give the talk and she did refer to garments and wearing them and she called them garments of the holy priesthood over and over which I don't think I've ever heard in any talk. So correct me if I'm wrong, but she definitely doubled down on all of that and explained that we needed to wear them night and day. 
Yeah, for sure. And Landon here, her controversial remarks were from last week and they went explosive on Instagram. Did she deal with that in any way? Did she say, you know what? I misspoke or let me clarify that or I've heard you or we've thought about this and we're going to change the way that we're doing here based on this incredible Instagram post or was it just business as usual? She didn't re refer to this at all, uh, which surprised me that she didn't even make a, a concession that, you know, hey, ladies, we hear you. Instead, she talked about symbolism, which I thought was quite striking because I kind of saw a symbol here that, hey, we're now sending you out to talk to women about underwear after you uh, told them how much power and authority they had. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Now let's uh, get a couple of other reactions here from Sister Dennis's remarks. Can you read that, Rebecca, that white cat prophecy brought yeah. out? It says, one way you know the LDS Church is God's organization on earth is the way prophets use their worldwide broadcast to explicitly condemn the wars, genocide, and other evils happening to people right now. You would never hear them use that time to talk about, say underwear. And of course that's completely facetious because there were several talks about underwear. There certainly were. And we're going to get into the, all of those here in a moment. And I saw Jesse that uh, kind of tweeted this out. Remember, this is the basically the very first talk in General Conference. Imagine that you invited your coworker to watch General Conference or somebody's <laughs> tuning into it for the first time, doesn't know anything about it. This is literally basically the first talk. I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to listen to a global religious meeting from a particular religion for the first time and hear someone spend 10 minutes talking about underwear for the first time. Can you imagine? the people out there listening to this who are not at all familiar with garments of the holy priesthood and you're hearing annette dennis talk about women yoga pants and underwear for the first 10 minutes especially since conference is promoted as remember last session life coaches you're going to get life advice and become closer to jesus it's it's very christianized right it's very universal you're going to come to know the lord that's how it's promoted. And then you're right. You tune in, you get somebody to tune in from your Christian community and it's all about underwear. Of course, they're going to, you know, reaffirm what they already know. Mormons are weird. <laughs> Yeah, and this just reminds me, Landon, a couple of weeks ago, there was that devotional where they literally oh. had women in bondage being bound up in the hands here. Mormons demonstrating how women are held in bondage uh, so much for being the most empowered in the world. We're talking about yoga pants, underwear, and binding women together in flax and cords. I mean, we're not off to a hot start on this general conference, Landon. No, uh, whenever we talk about women in the church, we're going to have a problem. There's just no getting around it. So uh, one of the things I thought was incredible is they keep they keep these men in until they're 90 years old and they try to promote, you know, oh, we've got all this wisdom. And yet when they call the women into these leadership positions, they're not 90 year old women. They're they're more uh, realistically, you know, 50s, 60s, where they can actually uh, do some good and and maybe make some changes, but their voices aren't heard. So I I don't know how much it helps to have these younger leaders uh, in the from women young leaders in there to to make a difference because I don't feel like their voice is heard. Well, and they also limit those terms for those women to yeah. five years, and that yeah. makes it so that they don't have the lasting impact. Mm -hmm. You can't build a lifelong connection yeah. with the women in the church because they're turned over at a much faster rate. But she wasn't the only one who talked about garments because later on, President Oaks, mm -hmm. because President uh, Dennis can't, uh, you know, Sister Dennis, not President Dennis, because she is, quote unquote, just a woman, he is going to have to reinforce what she said um, quoting here, because covenants do not take a day off to remove one's garments can be understood as a disclaimer of the covenant responsibilities and blessings to which they relate. In other words, it's the old hashtag, Rebecca, garments off, covenants off. Yeah. No, I love that. Did you make that up? <laughs> That's a good one. No, I feel like they're doubling down and I cannot wait to see what's going to happen because there are so many women who have received personal confirmations, personal revelations about their relationship with garments, how they wear them, when they wear them, how they use them as part of their worship. And they really feel very strongly that they are doing what is right for them. And they have had a spiritual uh, witness about it. And so here they are from the pulpit saying, nope, I'm really sorry. I'm going to tell you how you need to wear it. And if you don't, you literally aren't keeping your covenants anymore. So I feel like there's, again, going to be a lot of pushback from women that say, nope, absolutely not. I know my feelings. I know how I worship. I'm okay with God and my garments. So we'll see. Now, well, Landon, I, go ahead, Landon. Sorry. I was going to say, I think that uh, it, it's kind of like you said, it, a, a woman said this. So now a man has to come and reinforce it and say, brother, and this applies to you too. 
because we all know that the men in the church don't listen to the women in the church. So you had right. to have a priesthood authority stand up and say, hey, we're serious about this, guys. You have to do it, too. Yeah, Sister Dennis has absolutely no authority, even though she is the second highest ranking woman in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But look on the bright side here. President Oaks didn't give his tried and true demagoguery regarding LGBTQ and his marriage hobby horse. This is kind of like how President Oaks looks at General Conference. We can either go straight and go on his famous hobby horses of LGBTQ and be moaning the uh, gay lifestyle, or we can take a right and go to Garmin Guilt, uh, or we can just talk about temples and covenants. And it looks like he kind of went for the middle slash right on this particular conference. Yeah, I was surprised, but then again, not surprised because garments are the hot button right now, what everybody's talking about. So we had yeah. to address it. And that's why I saw this meme out there. Each ward is now going to have a volunteer undergarment checker monitoring the rebellious women in the bathroom, checking things out, making sure those yoga pants, hey, you got to make sure you got the garments on underneath the yoga pants. I, this isn't a calling that I'm relishing. I can tell you that much for sure. I know some people are into it, but I definitely am not. I, I feel like some people might volunteer for that calling, you know, <laughs> and there's precedence from that. I mean, I hear my mom talk about being a young woman's leader in the sixties and the girls would come into the church. Of course, this is the age of mini skirts. They would make them kneel down. And my mom had a ruler and she would hold it up to the skirt. And if it was too short, they would be sent home to change. They were not welcome at the meetings or in the Lord's house. So there's precedence for clothing checking, especially of women. Uh, that is that is a, really a crazy thought, honestly. I'm glad that I didn't grow up in that area. And I guess, you know, I'm using my Y chromosome. I guess I didn't have to go through with that since I am part of the patriarchal church organization. Now let's transition to the next uh, uh, talk here that also went viral here, which is uh, uh, Elder Jack and Gerard. Integrity, a Christ-like attribute. He said, quote, living a life of integrity requires us to be true to God, true to each other and our divine identity. And it just got me thinking, whoa, hey, wait a minute. How'd the SC char SC CC charge get, you know, what about the integrity there and the Christ-like attribute? Does he not see that there is a disconnect between these two things? The hypocrisy of this particular talk is quite stunning. Well, there are a lot of talks that are do as I say, not as I do. There were several like that. And, and it's okay. They're just instructing the members on how they should comport themselves. It doesn't apply back at you. Yeah, Landon, look at this quote here from uh, Elder Gerard. He said, saying we have integrity is insufficient if our actions are inconsistent with our words. But this is, Landon, this is the same church that claims to be the gold standard of protecting children. And in the AP sex abuse, it said the church in the legal document said that the bishops had no legal obligation in that instance to report the abuse. So they didn't. And the abuse continued on so much for having integrity and being consistent with your words. Oh yeah, I, I was actually screaming at the at the screen during this talk because I was I was going, you know, what about the SEC fine? What about protecting children? Uh, what about uh, the, the 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 women in the priesthood uh, and the women coming back? Uh, where, where's the integrity there to stand up and to actually respond and give an answer? Uh, there there are so many places in the church where. There is no integrity. I heard over and over, be polite in your social media, be polite in the, in the words you use. Let's be friendly, neighborly. Then they go build these big temples and they pay off city council members and they just steamroll everybody. And then they say, be nice, be kind. There must be the best of feelings. And I'm going, where is the integrity? Where is the partnership? Where is the do what I say, not what I do? Yeah, for sure. And this isn't the only part of Elder Gerard's talk that went viral as well. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important mm -hmm. quotes that I saw that came out of this talk. And it said, the quote, the worldly pull can be as direct as to destroy fidelity in marriage or as subtle as posting anonymous comments critical of church doctrine or culture, quote, and he, uh, end quote, he said. So we got adultery on one side. And then we have posting negative comments about not, not about church leaders, not about church doctrine, even church policies. We have adultery and criticizing church policies in the same sentence. That's why somebody tweeted this out. The winner of this conference is Gerald, uh, Gerald's Saturday morning talk, equating anonymous posting of criticism of church culture and adultery, putting those in the same sentence. Come on now. <laughs> Sin next to murder, right? There's a lot of sins in the list next to murder. Yeah, absolutely well, crazy. That, that was one thing I saw here was he was he was tying integrity to the fact that if if you criticize the church or the church culture, you have no integrity, he, he basically said. So the church can't be 
the, the church always has integrity because by his definition, uh, integrity means following the church no matter what. So the church always has integrity. Only those who question the church do not have integrity. And and that one was just, I, I was practically laughing as I heard this because I'm going, <laughs> uh, it takes all the integrity in the world to stand up to the institution, which is saying something that everyone knows is wrong. And to just follow along, that's the complete lack of integrity. Integrity means standing up when it's not popular. Indeed. Uh, or how about this one? You know, I heard there was a general conference talk warning against posting things about the church on social media from anonymous accounts. Did I miss that? And of course, DBase is an anonymous account. And there's a lot of people who are in this sphere who do it on anonymous accounts. Yeah. And we do that for a reason is because of a little thing called the Strengthening Church Members Committee. Yeah. And also because of the possible ramifications that can come from having your name associated with these things, especially if you do business with Latter-day Saints. There's a reason that people keep themselves anonymous. And I've, um, I'm very much, uh, I'm very much a part of that. And it just kind of reminds me of this, just checking in. Are you being <laughs> a jerk on Twitter? I think that's what he's getting to. Uh, that's it. And, you know, we see this, um, Landon and I podcast a lot about the Heber Valley, Cody, Wyoming, and now Lone Mountain temples where the church is building a temple in a place where they've changed all the zoning, the, the zoning, and they've, you know, influenced city councils. And so the residents have Facebook pages, you know, where they're trying to post things, raise awareness, information, and a lot of them have to post anonymously for exactly the reasons that you just outlined. There is backlash, there is harm to businesses, and people are, do have to be very careful because of this machine, the church that can roll over people. Yeah. Now, uh, we're not going to play too many clips from General Conference because we don't have time. This would go too long if we did. But I thought that President Eyring's talk in particular on Saturday morning was very interesting. He talked about how he and his wife are at the Idaho Falls Temple. And at the same time, that incredible Grand Teton Dam failed and a number of people died. There was a big landslide back to where he was, where his children were. And this is the age before social media. So he didn't know if his children were OK because there was a dam that was broken. The lines were all cut down. He couldn't drive back. They had to hole up in a hotel and it was a sleepless night. Let's just play this one quick clip here and get Henry Ryan's take on how the temple has blessed his life. Tragic event. I recall Kathy pacing the floors into the early hours of the morning with worry about her children. Despite my own concerns, I was able to put my mind at ease and fall asleep. It wasn't long thereafter that my sweet eternal companion woke me and said, Hal, how can you sleep at a time like this? These words then came clearly to my heart and mind. And so I said to my wife, Kathy, whatever the outcome, all will be well because of the temple, we have made covenants with God and have been sealed as an eternal family. Okay, so Rebecca, that's basically the sum up of it. How do you how how would you characterize his interaction with his wife, who's naturally very concerned about their four children at home, who they have no idea if they're still alive? Yeah, it's funny how there are so many examples of that where they'll, t and it's usually a woman who's asking the question, right? Remember P President Nelson talking about his daughter-in-law whose father had just died and she was so myopic because she was, you know, she was uh, mourning him when she'd see him again soon. Or the woman who wrote a letter and questioned about who will I be sealed to in the next life? I'm a second wife. They seem to dismiss women's valid concerns. And these concerns are real. Like what person is not concerned about their child in this scenario? Yet they're just completely brushed aside as, oh, you're not strong enough. You don't have a testimony enough to understand that everything will be okay in the eternal scheme of things where well, most of us live in real life. And we have those real questions. And especially when there are women just being dismissed, it's just par for the course. I did not like that story that he told. Yeah, Landon, remember, this is Henry. He's always seems to be flexing on people with less faith, you know, and he's not comforting his wife at all. And don't forget his wife passed away. So he's telling this story about his wife. She passed away last year. She has no ability to defend herself. Instead, she should have been trusting her priesthood authority.
authority instead of being concerned about her children. And the problem with trusting a priesthood authority is he has no idea if his children are okay or not. And instead of comforting her, he sweeps her under the rug. He should have, but she should have trusted in him. And Kathleen has passed on. Uh, this is a this is a bad story here, Landon. Yeah, I I had a hard time believing it actually. Um, <laughs> I, I I mean, I know that the there was a flood in Teton when he was the president there. Uh, but I have a hard time believing he didn't know the, where his children were at that point. He's the president of BYU in eastern Idaho. He's like the most powerful man in the whole state at this point. Um, I think he could have made a call and uh, the police would have called on the radio and had his children checked. He also probably lives on the top of the, the hill there where the university is and his home was not in the path of the flood. I can't imagine a father thinking that his children could be in a river flooding with floating along with dead cattle uh, pinned under something, just waiting to be saved. And he's sleeping in a hotel. So I, I found it very difficult to believe the whole story. Uh, and then to just say, oh, don't worry, there's temple covenants. I mean, even in the scriptures, when Jesus was dying, God had to go hide his hide himself in a corner of the universe, we're told. Uh, but this this father just went to sleep because he'd been to the temple. It, it, it didn't make sense to me. And this isn't the only viral moment that came from President Nelson. And I got this meme off of Instagram and it says that God loves Mormons most. And can you read that, that little clip there, uh, Rebecca, and give your reaction to what he said about uh, the love that God has, especially for Latter-day Saints? Uh, uh, you're, you're on mute there. You're I'm on muted. Mute. I'm pulling an RFM. That's right. I was going to say, this is a Henry B. Eyring. He says this, once we make a covenant with God, we leave neutral ground forever. God will not abandon his relationship with those who have forged such a bond with him. In fact, all those who have made a covenant with God have access to a special kind of love and mercy. And of course, we're talking about a Mormon covenant with God, right? Where if you go back to that religion chart, we're not talking about all those millions of people in the world now and who've ever lived. We're talking about an itty bitty tiny <laughs> percentage of people that are protected, the chosen people. Yeah, we definitely are. Now, transitioning over to President Holland, who was in a coma recently for five weeks and was unconscious. He has now been reinstalled as the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And by the way, he was done so without any common consent whatsoever. But he did give a talk, which a lot of people found that resonated with a lot of people, considering the fact that he has been in poor health. And he called it motions of a hidden fire. And he said in that particular talk that there were things that he couldn't decide discuss publicly out there with the rest of us because they were too special and sacred. In fact, he said, quote, I cannot speak fully of the hospital experience here, but I can say part of what I received was an admonition to return to my ministry and more urgent with more mer urgency, more consecration, more focus on the savior and more faith in the world. And it's just, I I'm wondering what is so sacred? Because we talk about the first vision all the time. We talk about the garden of Gethsemane all the time. We talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. These are the most sacred events in all of Mormondom, but we can't talk about what happened in the hospital. I'm confused here. Why is that so special? I, I have the same question. You're a special witness for Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ came and told you something, witness of it. Tell us what it was. If you're <laughs> going to keep it secret, what's the purpose of having a witness? Uh, that You're not a witness if you don't tell what happened. Yeah, and also this came from the talk, Rebecca. He said, when Christ comes, he needs to recognize us not as nominal members, but as thoroughly committed disciples. That is one of the lessons I have learned repeatedly this past year. And people are saying, well, you know, it's the old Mormon trite that you can never do enough. You can't be nominal. You have to go above and beyond. Notice me. I came back from the dead and I'm still working. What's your excuse? <laughs> No, and this is the harmful um, point of view that causes scrupulosity, that causes people to have perfectionism in the church that's absolutely rampant. And it's an extremely harmful dogma to put out there. And also, as far as that idea of it's too sacred to share, it is very interesting because people need that. People are begging, please, you know, if their faith is wavering, please show me something, tell me something from your personal life that I perhaps can be inspired by. And I see this with leaders. I see the this with personal people, family members, they just, they say it happened and happened to me. I can't tell you. 
for God's sake, tell someone. It might actually help somebody stay in the church. I don't understand why they won't share these experiences. Is it because they themselves know that it doesn't really, you know, pass the smell test? I don't know, but they won't share them. It's also very mysterious just to say something happened. You know what I mean? It's got that aura about it. Indeed it does. Now, um, Landon, I wrote a summary up here for the Saturday morning session. Can you read that? Give me your reaction. <laughs> Don't forget that we control your underwear, how, when, and where you wear it. <laughs> that that was pretty much it. The the other thing I came away with was temple, temple, temple. That yeah. seemed to be all they were talking about was temple, and the underwear was just a part of going to the temple. Yeah. Yes, it certainly was. Now transitioning to Saturday afternoon, uh, we uh, you know President Nelson wasn't there for the first session of conference, but he was wheeled out for the Saturday afternoon session. And this is crack reporting here by Tad Welch, President Russell M. Nelson, just entered the conference center and took his seat with the rest of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve for the start of the Saturday afternoon session. And we're getting this picture here, which is a very <laughs> viral picture. We talked about the age of the LDS presidents. Rebecca, look at the age here of, you know, we've got church security wheeling these guys around. These guys are so old. I know. And I get it. I'm older than both of you here on the podcast, but I, I keep thinking about Joseph Smith, you know, scrappy band, a mid 20 something people putting a church together. I feel like if they came back today, they'd go, what is this? This is not what we had in mind. This is not dynamic leadership at all. I think they'd be confused. Yeah, you, people wonder why Mormonism is not resonating with the young folks. This picture is not going to get it done. Imagine that these were replaced by, I don't know, like a Justin Trudeau type leadership or even a Stacey Cram type excitement. You would see a, you know, the, the prophet president of the community of Christ. You would see a completely different resonance. And that's why I got this one. Uh, you know, OK, Rusty, let's wheel you back to the nursing home so you can speak to God. I mean, it's just crazy how old these guys are. And it's it's, it's, it's really, really difficult for me to not crack a few jokes, which is I, I see people on X saying, look, these guys can barely get around. And that's bolstering my testimony. Look what they're doing. They can barely move, but they're making the effort. And that's so inspiring to me. If that's so inspiring to you, maybe we should just wheel them out in a gurney. Is that more inspiring to have them barely, you know, if they're, you know, having oxygen, does that bolster your testimony if they can barely move? How is it inspiring? I don't understand the inspiration behind it. That's that's I've got a big problem with the age of the presence of the church here, Landon. You, you know where else I see people in wheelchairs? Walmart. Um, not extremely inspiring when I see them. It's what you got to do. It's what you do uh, to, when, when you when you're in a wheelchair. So uh, I, I I don't see anything specifically inspiring, but I do see it turning the youth away with so many uh, people out there. You got like a Joel Olstein who just paces out and and is given a sermon that you're just you know pegged to your seat as you listen to him speak for an hour and these guys get up and read from a teleprompter and and it, i wasn't even sure irene's arms worked while he was reading uh it, it becomes very difficult to uh, to be inspired by by that kind of leadership it certainly does. Now, Saturday afternoon, we also got Quentin Cook out there who this was tweeted out by Sky over there. He's the uh the church is one of the church's token Mormons, who's in a mixed faith relationship, does occasional columns for the Deseret News. So he always tweets out the church's line on these things about the gay issues, because this conference actually had very few LGBTQ references. They seem to have toned it down quite a bit. But Sky picked up on it and he uh, tweeted this out, uh, quoting President Cook. Some have wrongly assumed that because all people are invited to receive his goodness and eternal life, there are no conduct requirements, but the scriptures attest that all accountable persons are required to repent of sins and keep his commandments. So uh, the sum up here for Quentin Cook for me is being gay, that's bad, but investment fraud, no issues. And I, I think the reason they weren't talking LGBTQ is because the, the whole conference was about temple and covenants and they're not allowed to go there. So there was no reason to ad address it. Yeah, for sure. Now, this is my favorite clip from Quentin Cook that uh, the entire general conference right here. It's a short clip, but I want to play this for you because it's my favorite clip of the entire conference. And finally, guys, there's something that I can agree with Quentin Cook on 100 um, percent. Let's get your uh, thoughts on Quentin Cook and his controversial statement. There's no such thing as God and there's no free will. And this is a vast, indifferent, empty universe. <laughs> one more time, one more time There's for no you. There's no such thing as God, 
and there's no free will, and this is a vast, indifferent, empty universe. I can find. No I can finally agree. Oh, sorry, I can finally agree with Quentin Cook on something. <laughs> and I have to say that is very comforting. The randomness of everything is comforting. Yep, I agree with them. Now, naturally, we're taking that out of context for sure, but we're not taking it out of context any more than the Gospel Topics essays haven't taken things out of context. So I think I think it's okay to play that particular clip there. But finally, somebody has spoken to me at General Conference. I found that to be the most moving eight seconds of the conference. Well, and, I, lo uh, I love how they I love how they attack anyone who doesn't believe in God and who believes in the randomness of the universe, and yet all of the talks were about how you might be healed, you might not be healed. You might have the faith for a miracle, you might not have the faith for a miracle to happen. Everything they talked about was, oh, God's pretty random as well. But if you believe in randomness, uh, well, then you're you, you must be a, a, a sad, pathetic person. <laughs> let's get a let's get this moving right along here. Brent H. Nielsen of the seventy here. He uh, gave a talk here, Rebecca, a record of what I have both seen and heard. And this is the quote that I got out of that particular talk. He said this. Let me get your reaction. Quote: There has never been a better time to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ than today. What do you think about that? Well, and, and I, I didn't focus on this talk very much, so I'm not sure of his whole context, but, you know, Landon and I also often take slack, flack on our podcast for talking about the heyday of the church in the 80s and that, and that kind of, you know, era. So I don't know. I feel like my childhood in the church was a lot better than what's happening today. There's just a lot out there that is so confusing to be a member today, I think, to have to navigate. There's a lot of pressure. It was a heck of a lot better before the internet. I think yes. that much is yes. for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, David Bednar gave an address here. They said, be still and know that I am God. And a particular quote on this, Landon, went global because it was very puzzling to some people. He said, quote, the Savior is not the foundation. Rather, we're admonished to build our personal spiritual foundation on him. Wait a minute. The Savior isn't the foundation? Uh, can you explain that? Can you translate that for me, Landon? I'm confused. Well, I, I think he was making the argument that uh, Jesus was the bedrock and that you put the foundation on the bedrock and that's how you build a solid uh, building. The problem is the foundation then becomes the church or the prophets or the apostles, which means you can't get to God without going through them. And the way you anchor yourself to Christ is by anchoring yourself to the church or to the apostles, which means in this church, you have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You must go through the institution to do it. The Savior is not the foundation. You know, guys, even ChatGPT couldn't figure this one out. That was a puzzling quote for sure. Nobody knows exactly what he meant by that. I think, Landon, you very well could be right. But we talked about this pre-show. Uh, Rebecca, did you run his talk through the <laughs> plagiarism checker? That was your responsibility. Were you able to get that done? No, I just assumed it was plagiarized. Oh. And I didn't even bother to run it through. So. I don't think it was. I don't think anyone else has ever made that argument that the, that Jesus isn't the foundation. Oh, no. And I've seen Christian sites that are tweeting about this. I've seen you know people in our community that are Christians that are saying, I can't believe he said this out loud. This is incredible. The LDS Church is a middleman um, taking a cut of what you have to do to get to God. It's just, it's ridiculous. And, and their cut is 100%. Uh, exactly. <laughs> the Savior is not the foundation. I'm learning new things. You know, for, you know, forget what I said. I am learning new things about the church every single time, and this is absolutely no exception. That was a puzzling statement, to be yeah. sure. Uh, transitioning to the Saturday evening session, we had Elder Uchtdorf, who gave a talk that he said, a higher joy. The peace he gives us is not like what the world gives. It is better. It is higher. It is holier. This seems to have been a very popular talk. In fact, Rebecca, I got this off of uh, X or Reddit, I think as well. It said, if every speaker taught like Uchtdorf, I wouldn't have a problem with general conference. There's no covenant path, no temples, no fear mongering, just Jesus, prayer, love, joy. It wouldn't make the church true, but it'd make it a lot, a lot less toxic. It seems like Elder Uchtdorf really bucks the system and he's kind of on his own path as it were. He doesn't drink the Kool-Aid that everybody else does. And that's, uh, it seemed like a pretty good talk, or at least we'll say it this way, a less harmful talk than a lot of the other general conference talks. 
Oh, no, all of his talks are always that way. And that's why he was demoted and sent down. But I believe he will have his day. I really feel like age wise, demographic wise, he's going to rise to the top eventually. But as I said, I had that list of words that I felt would be mentioned over and over. um, Temple, garments, covenant path, children of the covenant, ongoing restoration, you know, those buzzwords that really hammer at you. He didn't really mention any of those. I think he might have quoted President Nelson or mentioned him. Every other speaker did. But I'm not even sure if he did. And if he did, it was sort of innocuous just in there. It was not like a hero worship kind of thing. So no, his talks are always a breath of fresh air among a wasteland. Yeah, for sure. You know, Landon, was it was it a mistake demoting Dieter F. Uchtdorf considering the fact that, you know, he doesn't give anti-LGBTQ tirades. He doesn't go off of, you know, all common sense. He generally gives an uplifting talk that talks about living a good life and being a good person. And he's even admitted that there's been some mistakes from church leaders in the times past back in 2013. It seems like, you know, this church would be a vastly different place if Elder Uchtdorf ever makes it to the top. I, I think Uchtdorf is the only chance this church has in the next 40 years to actually make change in a positive direction. Uh, if if he gets in, uh, I think there will be changes in a positive direction. I don't see anyone uh, higher than him who will make these changes, and I don't see the people who would be coming in behind him to make these positive changes. He's the best hope we have for making positive changes that aren't so toxic. So. Demoting him to me was absolutely uh, a problem, but it, it it may turn out to be a benefit uh, in the end that he wasn't associated with these other guys who who are so toxic. He's well, Obi Wan Kenobi. He's our only hope. Well, don't forget, he was in the First Presidency for a number of years, so his hands and his teachings are tainted by the SEC scandal and the fraudulent hoarding of $300 billion. Let's not forget that he was part of the First Presidency and presumably had the access and knowledge as to the church's obfuscation. That definitely calls into question his teachings. But as far as the Saturday night is concerned, a couple of others here. Stephen R. Bangader. Hey, don't you live by the Bangader Highway there, Landon? I do. I was wondering when I heard his name, I'm going, is that Governor Bangader's son or, <laughs> or a relative? It's got to be a relative. <laughs> hey, it's nice to be connected in the Mormon power scheme, isn't it? at Landon. Yeah, That's uh, the only way to be connected. <laughs> you bet. So he quoted from this, our father in heaven will answer your prayers. You will feel his love envelop you as you sincerely ask and genuinely desire to know uh, and quote elder Stephen R. Bengader. And I saw this from Jen next door who I always follow on Twitter. And she said, well, I prayed for help due to sexual abuse while the LDS church enabled a leadership known predator to abuse me and others for years and then covered up his abuses. Then the LDS church did nothing to help all of his victims. Didn't feel so loving. The LDS church doesn't care at all. You know, it's amazing whose prayers get answered around here and whose prayers don't, Rebecca. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think we look at almost all the talks like that. We're like, oh gosh, you know, it's a nice sentiment perhaps, but is it rooted in reality? Often not. Yeah. Do you think this prayer is going to be answered? Can you read that for us, Landon? Dear Heavenly Father, why am I a second class <laughs> member of thy kingdom? <laughs> I think uh, in the church, they will tell you all prayers are answered, regardless of if they're not answered or not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, according to El- Elder Bangader, her prayer will be answered. I do wonder what the answer will be. Now, that transitions over here to Sunday morning. We're giving it to you fast and furious here. Sunday morning, Elder Rasband. This I'm giving you the highlights here that I put together from what I believe are the most important addresses for this general conference. And he said, so very important are our words. Believe me, in our emoji-filled word, our words matter. And in fact, if you look on his uh, Twitter posting here, he actually had a couple of emojis in there. And this is what I find very remarkable about his because he said our words can be supportive or angry or joyful or mean or compassionate or tossed aside in the heat of the moment. Words can sting and sink painfully deep into the soul and stay there. And he gave us a couple of words for us to ponder. And he said this. Uh, Rebecca, let me get your take on this. I couldn't believe what I was reading. Maybe I am just, uh, I don't know. Let's check it out, his suggestion. He said, let me suggest three simple phrases we can use to take the sting out of difficulties and differences, lift and reassure one another. He gave us three words. Thank you, I'm sorry, and I love you. Um, Do you see any incongruity or do you see a little bit of uh, irony in his words matter talk, Rebecca, or is it me? 
No, it's not just you. And it really is a scenario, again, of do as I say, not as I do. Because those three phrases, um, when they say thank you, they don't often say thank you. You need to do your duty and you're expected to do it. And often there is not a thank you. And I'll go to the last one. When they say I love you, there are often so many strings attached to that that it's hard to even believe that that's real. And the one that I really had a problem with is I'm sorry, because we have been told, of course, that the church never offers apologies. They do not <laughs> say I'm sorry. And there are so many scenarios where that would go a long way to healing situations with marginalized groups, things like that. So I don't see that the church itself uses any of these phrases, at least institutionally. Yeah, it's amazing that he seems to be divorcing what the church's a modus operandi is with what we should do in our personal lives. And I find that to be extraordinarily incongruous, considering the fact that the church has never really apologized for anything in its entire history. That's the, word, the only. Word, uh, oh, sorry. The words, Landon, I, the words I always hear him say is, you know, we don't care what you think. We don't want to hear what you have to say and we'll build it wherever we want. That seems to be the, the statements the church <laughs> makes so much of the time. Yeah, especially with, with regards to the temple and especially with regards to uh, Sister Dennis's comments in particular, there was no return and report considering the uproar from Sister Dennis's 182nd Relief Society. They said that the senior leaders were going to look at it and they didn't address the controversy about women's empowerment mm -hmm. in the church at all during the entire general conference. So much for return and report, so much for bringing us further light and knowledge that the Father was supposed to send to us. Now, the Sunday afternoon session is probably the most important session and here we had president nelson give his address and guys he spent a great deal of time talking about the kirtland temple and i believe that's a particular topic that you guys know quite a bit about we were yelling at the screen. This is an episode that we just put out with the amazing Rob Lauer. I think last week, you can find it on Mormonish Podcast, all about, well, you can see the title of our, of our episode, Elijah and the Sealing Power, the Kirtland Temple Narrative Debunked. And maybe, Landon, do you want to go into this? Because everything that President Nelson said, this is not accurate as far as what happened at the Kirtland Temple. And one of our concerns with the Kirtland Temple now being in the hands of the LDS Church is, the COC, Community of Christ, they did not share this narrative of Elijah, Elias, Moses, or the Savior because they've gone through the documents. They understand the provenance is not there to even show that this ever even happened. And now that it's in the LDS hands, I believe this is a story that is going to be told to every visitor that comes. We saw it shared by President Nelson today. Landon, do you want to go into this? Exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. To, to tell a narrative that they know isn't true uh, right there in conference is, is just extremely uh, disappointing. Uh, we went through this uh, just on that podcast, as you said, and it's clear Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, neither one of them ever mentioned Elijah, Elijah, Moses, or Jesus Christ showing up in the temple. It's not there. It's not in the records. There's a third hand witness from uh, Oliver Cowdery's Warren brother, Cowdery. Warren, Warren. Warren Cowdery, yeah. that was written on the back page of a journal. Nobody knows where uh, where it came from. It has no date on it. Uh, okay. And so to, to make this claim with uh, Joseph and Oliver, not only did they never say they that it didn't happen, they kept referring to it happening in the future tense, that it would happen, that it will, that they shall come, that they will come, which is was a very Christian idea at the time was that Elijah and Elias and Moses would come right before Jesus came in the end and restore all of these uh, these keys. That was a Christian belief. And from the words that we see from Joseph Smith, he was still looking forward to that happening, even though this is eight years in the past that it supposedly did happen. So there's a huge problem with this narrative. The church leaders know this. They have to know this. And yet here they come out and tell you this story that just has no backing. Yep. And to be clear, so when we talk about a third party account from scribe um, Warren Cowdery, it said things like they beheld Jesus. They saw last page of a journal. The entry right before that entry is an account of Joseph Smith passing out the sacrament to all of the participants in the Kirtland dedication. And of course, we know the sacrament 
was wine at the time. So you have the entry about the wine. Then you have a third party account in the very end of a journal about seeing Elias, Elijah, Moses, the savior. So then what happens? This is 1836. We never hear about it ever again. Joseph and Oliver never mention it in their entire life that this happened in the Kirtland temple. Finally, in 18, I think 42, it's rewritten by Willard Richards into a first party account where it appears that Joseph says, I then saw the savior. I saw Elias. And this is given in a sermon by Orson Pratt. That's the origin of it. The provenance is very, very suspect. Now, I know they say it was originally a firsthand account. And as scribes often would, they will look at this firsthand account, supposedly written by Joseph or Oliver or both, and then they'll put it in the journal in a, a, as a third party. They'll change it to they. So so again, they're hinging on this missing document out there where it was written. But to me, the smoking gun is just what Landon said in all their orations, both Joseph and Oliver. They never said, remember when that thing happened? Remember when Christ came and Elias came and Elijah came? They do not say that. They say, we look forward to the day Elijah will come. We look forward to, you know, the, the welding link, to the sealing power. And this was regular Christian rhetoric. So it was always a future tense. In their lifetime, it was never mentioned as something that had happened. So that's extremely problematic. And I would like more people to look into it. Uh, different people. Our friend Rob Lauer, he had a lot of information on it. But I would love to see this researched farther because it's a big deal if this is the narrative that everything hinges on, the sealing power, when as a post-Mormon, you have to stand outside the temple while your children are inside being married. What is really happening there based on their own doctrine and the provenance of these sealing keys? I think it needs to be looked at. Boy, I'm on a soapbox, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, this was a fantastic episode. And Rob Lauer did a fantastic job yeah. on what we learned from that episode, or at least what I learned from it, is the fact that not only was the priesthood restoration retrofit, the, the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, not only was the first vision retrofit, is that the Kirtland Temple narrative is completely retrofit. And what we saw in General Conference just a few hours ago was President Nelson trotting out a narrative in which we know that the facts are absolutely not accurate. It's not a matter of faith. We know that it did not happen because there was no contemporaneous effort, uh, uh, no contemporaneous re record of it, and that the people who were involved said that these things were yet to come into the future. So it's a fantastical narrative that is completely divorced from reality, and President Nelson is doubling down on it, saying that these are the important things which are leading me to build temples. So the foundation for his temple announcements we know is built on a sandy foundation, and that's an incredibly problematic thing to take. Any, any other comments on the uh, Kirtland Temple narrative with regards to President Nelson on this, guys? I would just like to, I'd like to hear from somebody who has taken the tour, the new tour. I have yet to find somebody that's gone through because I would like to know what is being said. As Rob Lauer explained to us, the COC, Community of Christ, did not share this narrative because they did not trust or acknowledge the provenance of it as we explained. So I would like to I would like to hear so if any of you have taken that tour drop us a line let us know what they are saying. Very interesting stuff. Now, we got to get the temples because that's always the biggest okay. announcement, which is to say for Sunday afternoon. And President Nelson or the president of the church usually gives the temple announcement. How do you like my angel Moroni? You know, it's not on the top of the temple. What about putting Donald Trump on the top of those temples? What do you guys think? It, it looks like it's about to topple. It's a little <laughs> top heavy. I don't know. <laughs> that, that looks like Donald Trumpet. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he's selling the Bibles now for $60, guys. Uh, are you guys buying those uh, Donald Trump the Bibles, Trump by the way? Bible. No, we have not. Maybe we need to get a copy of that, man, and just for posterity. <laughs> Well, I think he looks incredibly handsome on the top of those uh, temples. I think he would fit right in there. And as far as the Trump Bibles for $60, what I think we need to do is put the JST into those Bibles and then sell them for $100. Now we're talking, by the way. Talk about your merch. Wow. <laughs> I, I can see this is not going over well, so let's keep on going here. <laughs> President Nelson, re, this is his particular address on Sunday. He pre-recorded it. Honestly, he looked a little better in this one than mm -hmm. he did in the Think Celestial mm -hmm. talk yep, last year. Absolutely, His eyes are better. His, his countenance is better. I don't know if they're using an Instagram filter on it, but he, he, he was more lucid. He was clear. I think it was a better talk overall as far as aesthetics are concerned. Are you with me? Oh yeah, last year, last year people thought he was AI and they even ran the talk through an AI generator, which a couple of the analyses came back and said, there is a high chance that this whole thing is AI. So yeah, there were some definite questions last year. I thought he looked a hundred percent better this year. 
which I'm very happy to hear, considering the fact that he's almost 100 years old mm -hmm. for sure. Now, a couple of quotes from his particular talk. We already talked about the Kirtland Temple, which he talked a great deal about it, but he said, nothing will help you more to hold fast to the iron rod than worshiping in the temple as regularly as your circumstances permit. He basically laid out the groundwork as to why he has announced so many temples. Now, last general, last year in the general conferences, he, was, uh, he announced 15 temples. He announced 20 temples. This time he went ahead and announced 15 temples. Let's walk through these. Lennon, can you read the ones on the left? Yeah, I probably can't pronounce them, but I can. Uh, <laughs> Aturoa, French Polynesia, Chihuahua, Mexico, Florinopolis, Brazil, Rosario, Argentina, and Edinburgh, Scotland. What do you think about those, uh, Rebecca, on the left? Oh, you know what? I'm not surprised. I, I don't think there's going to be a place where there isn't a temple. Eventually, I would say to any of these locations, call us if they start to manipulate your city council or put LDS people into positions of power in your city to push through ordinances and zoning. Just call us. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Edinburgh, Scotland is one that has been greatly anticipated for a long period of time. So I know that a number of people were looking forward to that. On the right, we have Brisbane, Australia South, Victoria, British Columbia, Yuma, Arizona, Houston, Texas South, and Des Moines, Iowa. Those seem pretty rudimentary to me, Landon. Yeah, I think David Alexander, didn't he move from Brisbane so he could go to the temple here in Pocatello? He uh, he so, uh, boy, he could have stayed there. Uh, yeah. I, I think maybe they built one just for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay and here is the last of the list of 15 we had uh cincinnati ohio uh, excuse me cincinnati ohio honolulu hawaii west jordan utah lehigh utah and mara sabayo venezuela west jordan landon isn't that in your neck of the woods everything is in my neck of the woods <laughs> where they build these i i'm i'm sitting here thinking in, in a circle draper taylorsville yeah. jordan river uh, now they're going to have Lehigh, American yeah. Fork. Uh, they just brought Sarasota Springs, uh, Linden, and Orem. I mean, that's oh, eight yeah. of them within about a 12-mile length of the freeway. It's it's yeah. absurd at this point. That's a lot of temples. And another Hawaii temple, I believe that will be the third temple in the Sandwich Islands. So any last thoughts on the particular uh, announcements here of the temples? This is 15 temples, probably averaging around $50 million a piece, give or take. We're talking about $650 million worth of new structures. So the church on average is, you know, announcing about a billion dollars per year in temples because there will be another announcement of in, in October for about about 15 more temples. So about a billion dollars per year in total temples. I don't think there was any groundbreaking surprises in any of this, mm -hmm. but it seemed like a pretty run of the mill average temple announcement. What do you think, Rebecca? Yeah. And we on Mormonish, we had predicted 15 temples. We actually had a whole temple prediction podcast ready to go. We had 30 slides, awesome AI, and then the teeny tiny golden plates hit. So we had to do that with Dr. Lundwall instead of a <clears throat> our temple predictions. I predicted the Lehigh Temple. That is on my drive to work every day. And I had some insider information that there was a plot of land that was sitting there that the church had purchased. So I will be excited to drive past and report on the progress of the Lehigh Temple every day on my way to work. Well, return and report then. The temple's announced here. First of all, we didn't have a TK smoothie like we did last time, talking about you know, potentially having your genitals removed in the afterlife if yeah. you drink coffee or don't pay enough tithing. So that's a win. Uh, he didn't double down on his never tank counsel from those who don't believe. He did the Think Celestial, though that seems to be trending. And he only, quote, only announced $650 million in temples. This was a routine temple announcement that is pretty run of the mill from my uh, perspective here. Landon, any last thoughts on temples or President Nelson? Um, and his particular address? No, this this is just one that, uh, to me, every time we get an announcement like this of 15, 20 more, it's just like, uh, I, I can't believe that people people aren't going to be excited about him anymore. In fact, I don't think people are excited about him. How, how can you be excited about it in Lehigh when you already have three others within five minutes? Uh, you know, it's like, it's like getting a big old tire announced that they're building <laughs> next to you, you know? It's probably more like, oh, crap, we're going to have to staff this. But I will say, I wonder if the list is so lackluster because I and others predicted 
that they wanted to announce the Kirtland Temple at conference. <laughs> Can you imagine how big that would have been? But right. instead, I think it was kind Good of broken point. prematurely. I think John Hycheck, others, you know, had insider information. They broke the news of the Kirtland sale, and then the church had to quickly put out press releases. But I believe, why would you break that news just a few weeks earlier? I believe that that announcement from President Nelson was supposed to be, and guess what, guys? I believe it was supposed to be the biggest moment of conference, and it didn't happen because it was leaked ahead of time. That makes a lot of sense, considering that the rest of the temple list is rather exactly. ho -hum. No yes. exotic locales, yep. nothing to see here besides maybe Scotland, and the rest of it is pretty mundane. Very good point here. But did you catch his announcement here? President Nelson issues historic proclamation on changes to the word of wisdom. We were wrong. Alcohol is freaking awesome. Did you guys see that at the end of the talk? No, I did we not. turned it off no. early. Oh. I so they're we finally be ready with, for this. We're, uh, they're finally going with the barley in the word of wisdom. They're realizing it's okay. Is this what's happening here? Uh, okay, that's just a joke here. Just oh, a no. joke here. Um, but uh, uh, the LDS Church uh, pledges real help to Gaza. Did you hear that in the announcement? Oh, no. Uh, oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> These are deep fakes, the kind that the church has warned us against in their 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 warnings against AI. I feel like these might be deep fakes. It, it's all dive that they're it's, talking about. That's right. They're talking about you. I do have an an anonymous account and I use AI. Ooh. Those are probably the two great dangers to the church. Or well, did the you're church, an adulterer. Did the church pledge uh, real help to Ukraine, by the way? Did they do that? Or nothing not, about Ukraine. Oh, no. no the, a massive land war in Asia. Hundreds of thousands of people dying. Two years of absolute suffering. Didn't say one word about it. Didn't pledge to help. Didn't lift a finger, even though the church has incredible resistance. Didn't talk about that. Or how about that? Did the uh, church announce uh, food kitchens, homeless shelters, women's domestic violence centers, mm -hmm. anything like that? Did you guys see that? No, that was not oh, on my conference that. bingo card. I didn't oh, see it at man. all. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, or finally, the LDS Church announces important leadership initiatives on women's reproductive health, climate change, anything like that? Oh, I did see that with the garments. That'll stop oh. our reproductive health. <laughs> yes. In fact, we're planning an episode on that. I'm talking to an expert who would know there actually is an impact on reproductive health and synthetic fabrics. So look for that. Yeah, there's a lot of UTIs that go along with those yeah, garment wearing, absolutely. by the way. Uh, yeah, we didn't see anything along the sort of that for sure. Uh, let's talk about the memes here. What do you think? Jordan Peterson in general conference. What do you think? That I think it fits. I don't know. He looks really intense. <laughs> I, I think it would give me more to think about after yeah, I listen to him at conference than I do the talks that I hear. So. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be something fun to see. But uh, uh, this is the part of the program here, guys, where I'm going to pull out the most obscure talk from the general conference. See if you guys actually watched it. I'm pulling out the 70 here and see if you guys can name it to see if you guys really are Mormonish podcasting legends. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I know you guys are good sports. Are you ready for this? We'll try. We'll try our best. We're kind of tired. It's been a long weekend. <laughs> no, Rebecca, no excuses. Come on. Elder Holland's talk. We don't want any mundane members of the church. Didn't you remember that? <laughs> Okay, you're ready for this? Okay. Okay, one, two, three. Left no. shark. Left shark. <laughs> it's got to be Elder Oaks, right? <laughs> All the 70s look the same, so I would have accepted any answer. It's it's. It's hard to tell them apart. That's really, uh, uh, oh, but they drew up the new hierarchy with the people taking the different positions. They published the new org chart here, guys. And it was, it was in the pyramid there. I noticed a kind of a similarity between the Mormon hierarchy and, you know, kind of like the Ponzi scheme. Did you guys see the new yeah. org chart? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to interpret, but there's definitely an upline straight to God, I think. Yeah, I definitely see a pyramid-like structure. That yeah. much is for sure. Uh, yeah. But what about the bingo cards in uh, mm -hmm. April General Conference? Did you guys get the bingos? You know, social media is scary. Uh, praise for President Nelson, misreading a teleprompter, Kirtland celebration, yeah. covenants, 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 wear your garments, Exmos are scary, President Nelson, fan, uh, fangirling fa President Nelson, some vehicle metaphor, uh, at least eight new temples, need new missionary. Did you guys get your bingo or did you get a blackout? Yeah, no, that's pretty accurate. I think it is a blackout. I think that'd be a blackout. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, pay your tithing, restored gospel, hetero marriage or bust, and women matter. Yeah, I think I got a blackout for sure. And what about this one? The First Presidency has issued the following statistical report, which used to be in conference, but it wasn't in this one. They took it out a couple of years ago. Guys, why did they take the statistical report out of general conference? I do wonder about that. Mm, I think they have a hard time finding somebody to read it with a straight face into the camera. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, if you go onto the website, they did release it at the same time here. And this is what Michael W. Towns Sr. said. Baptisms are up. Church haters are in tears of rage because baptisms are up year over year. The new children of record is 93,000. That's holding somewhat constant. Convert baptisms are slightly on the rise. There's no doubt about it. Uh, missionaries are basically holding strong. Senior missions are, again, basically holding strong. More temples in operation. The general church statistics here from the Salt Lake Tribune says that Converse children missionaries fuel post-pandemic surge and LDS growth. There's a lot of positive developments as the faith's memberships tops $17.2 million. What do you guys think of the statistical report? Oh, they can say there are a lot of baptisms. I believe that, but I have one word for that, and that is retention. Yeah, retention is could be quite low, but there's a lot more land in the meets the eye on these numbers. And I saw this uh, uh, YouTube clip. It's, it's pretty short here, but I want to play it for you. That breaks down these numbers, and there's a lot more that meets the eye here. Let me play this for you. Are they lying about the church statistics? Uh, let's find out. Today, the church released its statistical report for 2023, and I believe these numbers are deceptive. To demonstrate, we'll need to do a little math. The church reported that at the end of 2023, there were 17 million plus members. This is a change of 220,000 from the previous year. This change comes from two parts, the gain and loss. From convert baptisms and new children of record, there was a gain of about 350,000. So the church is reporting a loss of 120,000 members to death or disaffiliation. But is this number accurate? If we break down church membership into countries and use the average 2023 death rate for each country, we can estimate that about 130,000 members should have died in 2023. Disaffiliation is hard to estimate, but in 2014, Pew Research reported that 36% of members will leave the church. This rate is surely much higher now, but we'll be conservative and use this rate, which means we would expect 78,000 members to leave the church in 2023. So instead of the reported 120,000, the church most likely lost around 210,000. So do you think the statistical report is deceptive? Yeah, that's the question here is the deaths and also the disaffiliation. The church is is reporting about half of what we would expect, Landon. It seems like somebody's cooking the books. Well, we know they don't take the names off of the people that they don't know where they're at until they're 110 years old. And I'm guessing there's a lot more people that they don't know where they're at anymore. And they're just keeping their names on there because so many uh, people have left the church. Uh, like myself, who I have not taken my name off the record. So uh, when I die at some point, they can keep counting me till I'm 110 years old for their, for their numbers. So uh, I would guess that's probably a, a large reason why the deaths aren't equaling what you would expect because they don't report them till they're 110 years old. Yeah, but as far as ex-Mormon Reddit is concerned, Rebecca, boy, the numbers in ex-Mormon Reddit are confirmed that they continue to grow over there. The people who disaffiliate themselves seem to join the ex-Mormon Reddit and other things at a high frequency. Have you ever noticed that? You're muted again. <laughs> I'm literally channeling RFM here. I'm continuing to mute myself. Um, I was going to say that the numbers do seem to grow over there. And it seems like after conference, they definitely go up. There's like a surge, which is really interesting. And, and I agree with Landon. There are lots of reasons that people do not remove their records. Um, sometimes somebody's baptized and literally doesn't ever go again. You know, you have those kinds of baptisms and other people have been members from, for a long time. I'm still on the record and there are different personal reasons that you don't remove them. So the church knows the statistics. They are they are uber record keepers. They know the numbers. So it's very easy to wiggle around and cook the books, like you said, but they know the real numbers. So, yeah, now I'm also a member of record. Now, Nemo over there, he does the tracker between the mentions of Joseph Smith and the mentions of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have that right offhand, but I do a similar tracker over here, guys, with the evidence tracker. And I, I'm unveiling this for the first time here. I paid careful attention at this general conference to the unsubstantiated metaphysical claims at 3,973. But don't worry, guys. I know that seems like a lot. I put in the amount of hard data that backs up those claims. And I track that as well. And what? Oh, uh, oh man, no, hmm. uh, that must be a typo. Yeah, that's Actually, rough. it's not a typo that there's no evidence ever brought up in general conference for anything whatsoever. We're supposed to take yeah. everything that is said there on faith. And there's never anything that we can absolutely tether to reality. That's a major problem, at least for me.
Well, it is. And I think about the second talk, um, the primary president, when she addressed the children, and it was all about teaching the children, you don't need to study something, look for evidence, you just need to feel, you need to pray and have a good feeling. So they're starting very young to tell them that feelings mean I know. Those two are synonymous. Yeah, for sure. And the biggest elephant for me in the room here, Landon, there's a 600 uh, pound elephant in the room every time that we have general conference from now on. And that's the SEC fine, which you guys have released a number of episodes regarding it. Everyone who is at the top of this, minus Patrick Kieran, was involved in the fraudulent dealings in the SEC, the illegal dealings, the shameful fraudulent hoarding of $300 billion dollars which taints their teachings on morality and ethics for the rest of their tenure, which is why I'm calling for, I'm also a member of record for the first presidency to stand down and to step aside so that people who can lead this church, we don't have to wonder about the hypocrisy of trying to teach morality and ethics based on the fact that they were involved in investment fraud. It's a 600 pound elephant in the room that has still not been dealt with. They consider the matter to be closed, but I do not. I agree with you 100%, although this has been pretty much standard run of the mill since the church has started. We know Joseph Smith uh, with the Kirtland banking as, uh, uh, issues that they had there. We know Brigham Young was involved in a lot of things uh, that were related with uh, finances. Uh, we know several of the uh, other uh, leaders with the uh, sugarcane industry that were brought under uh the microscope and who were actually charged. So this is nothing new. The church has always done this and they continue to do it. And yet we continue to look at them for moral leadership. And I, I just don't get it. Yeah. And I just want to say on one other thing, people say, well, we got Patrick Kieran breathing in fresh light. What Patrick Kieran should have done on his first address is address the SEC and say, I hereby denounce the actions of other church leaders who were involved with the SEC fine. Don't trot him out as somebody who's a breath, 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 a uh, fresh breath of of uh, a fresh breath of <laughs> fresh air. That's when it. he he didn't take any accountability for it. If you were truly a representative of morality and ethics, you would have called out your senior brethren and told them that it's time for them to step aside. He didn't. So as far as I'm concerned, he's complicit. Now, uh, as far as the President Nelson mentions tracker, you know what do they call? It? What is that? A Google? It's it's a lot. I mean. I, I, I know the actual <laughs> numbers because I was on Nemo today. So I know the numbers. Um, it was Jesus Christ, I believe, was 34. Joseph Smith was five. And President Nelson was 54. It was something like that. So, you know, Jesus a lot. President Nelson way more. But the most interesting thing, Joseph Smith on the down low. They are not talking about him like they used to at all. Five mentions. That's it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that was uh, obviously a joke. Let's check in with the Mormon Onion. Couple last takes here. Gong says those who go who own temple clothes are more blessed because you're gong to the temple here. Mormon <laughs> Onion, what do you think? Gong to the temple. To the temple oh, and yeah. we're gong. Again, to the temple. No, fortunate for me, I own temple clothes. Uh, <laughs> what? Do you? <laughs> I still have them. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Very nice. I'm a big fan of the Mormon Onion. Or the second take, me watching General Conference. Uh, everything that guy just said is bs thank you that's the mormon onion summing it up wow. for you uh, i i, I would go. agree i felt the same way at the end <laughs> okay finally mormon onion my takeaway here is what were they even talking about in the 1920s and 30s because if you look at the mentions here of covenants covenant covenant path covenant relationship covenants and ordinances ordinances and covenants you will see that it absolutely spikes this is the general authority conference corpus which tracks the mentions of it and they're absolutely off the charts here in the uh, modern era since president nelson took over yeah. if covenants and the covenant path covenant relationship covenants and ordinances if they are so important then what in the world were people talking about back in the 1920s i guess they weren't important back then what what's changed i don't understand now, the Internet is what's changed. And now people need to be reminded that they need to be locked in. Not only did they make these promises and covenants at age eight, when, of course, we're all fully cognizant and can make lifetime decisions. But we also now know we made these promises in the pre-mortal life. We don't even remember at all. But we are held to those. We are reminded that we've already agreed to do it. And Landon had a really interesting thought about third party covenanting today. Didn't you, Landon? Maybe share that for a second. Well, we were talking about uh, how how can someone else make a covenant for you? And that seems to be what the brethren do. They tell you, you may, you're you making a covenant. 
And this is the promise the Lord is going to give you. The Lord, the Lord doesn't come down and tell us a covenant. Right. It's they're, a they're making it in his behalf. And you don't right. even know if, uh, if he's a part of it or not when they make yeah. some of these uh, rules and tell you that this is what you're, you're doing. Uh, you know, yeah. some of these seem to be Masonic covenants. So not sure how they came from God. Yeah, in fact, this stacker gave a pretty good sum up here of General Conference that goes right along with that. It seems that according to General Conference, being Christ-like is keeping covenants, mm -hmm. attending the temple, and wearing your garments. That's the basic sum up of General Conference that I got. But even though while Jesus was alive, he really never talked about any of those things. But now that's the entire focus of the church. It seems to be completely different than what we have the words of Jesus at least attributed to him. Totally different. It is. And there's an interesting way to think about this. And that is, you know, sometimes post-Mormons will say to their relatives, the church is pay to play, right? You have to pay to play. You have to buy your salvation. And they'll say, no, 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 that's not true. So this temple idea is another middle middleman technique. They say you must go to the temple, right? What do you have to do to go to the temple? You have to pay. You have to pay the tithing. You have to commit to the garments. It removes it from, you know, just this sort of sordid idea that you are actually paying to play. So most people don't catch it, but that's exactly what it is. I've got another sum up here of General Conference that I want you to read for us, Landon. I think this one sums it up pretty well, too. Can you take this one? A brief summary of the uh, April 2024 General Conference. President Nelson is awesome. Do everything he and the Q15 say. Stay on the covenant path. Only templed married families are forever. Pay tithing, go on missions, attend the temple, and don't leave. That's pretty accurate, isn't it? Oh, dead on. Yeah. That would have saved us how many hours if we just would have had that? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good sum up, in my opinion, for sure. Uh, and, you know, people are tweeting are tweeting this one out. The LDS Church is kind of like oh. the Titanic going down. We have the Mormon shrivel. We have serious decline. We have yeah. major disaffiliation. And at the same time, we get the same message repeated time and time again, warmed over and repackaged while people fiddle on the deck of the Titanic. Or how about this one here? You know, they have those drinking games that go along with the uh, general conference here, Landon. You know, it's a serious thing, though. If you're playing a drinking game with covenant as the key word, please stop because alcohol poisoning is a real thing. <laughs> Exactly. I haven't seen that one. That's great. <laughs> Chino Blanco is, uh, I'm a big fan yeah, of his. He he, is. He's amazing. He's I so had, good. He has appeared on the Mormon News Roundup, though. I was one of the few that got him for sure. So We asked uh, him to come on Mormonish, and he said no. Or said, ah. maybe, or said maybe later. So you seem to get the guests that not everybody can get. Uh, <laughs> I tend to wear people down. What can I tell you? <laughs> this was also uh, one that went viral here. You know, Elder Oaks talked about those trap doors. Do you remember the trap door talk uh, that he joked around about people who were at the lectern that if, what did he say? If they went too long, then the trap door yeah. would uh, suck them down yeah. below. Yeah. Well, uh, somebody put that together with Elder Holland here. Let's uh, play that one for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> I like the sound effect. Yeah. Yeah. That seems pretty accurate there. That's pretty good stuff. I like that a lot. I have a kind of a diabolical sense of humor, though. What can I tell you? Pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A couple last ones, uh, a couple last memes and things to take you out of here. Here, And this is also from, uh, since you were just on Nemo's program, you know, his conference predictions, uh, Rebecca, how accurate was he about his conference predictions? Uh, Non-LDS him, conducting, sustaining, all yep. this stuff. How, how close was he? He was, you know, I don't know where he gets his information, but he even has the talks word for word ahead of time. He knows he is in the know. I'm not kidding. Yes, uh, it seems like a pretty accurate summary. So Nemo did a very good job here. We just got a couple last slides here to take us out of here. And as you might remember here with uh, Kulch, uh, you remember you guys met up with Kulch here a short time ago, right? We did. We, we got to meet Thursday. him in person on yeah. Thursday. It was amazing. We toured an LDS museum um, in Provo and he wanted to go. He goes, I'm coming to Utah. There's one thing I want to do. Please take me to a bougie soda shop like swig, right? Because you know, we've all got our big drinks here in Utah. So we took him, he ordered like three of each. It was really a fun time. We love you, Colch. <laughs> I apologize. I had those pictures together and I somehow I lost them yeah. off of there. The only picture that I have left behind is this one here where he was in the, uh, where he was in the meeting yep. house here. Yep. And it, what's important here, guys, is not the, how I obtained that photo. That's not <laughs> important. I don't want you to th talk about the ethics of me getting yep. it. <laughs> but I did get him in the LDS meeting house here. That is just That's a right. small joke here. But the takeaways here, um, this is that time of the program here, guys, where we do the prophecy tracker, where we uh, 
uh, sorry, my, my a little bit of technical difficulties here. <laughs> but the prophecy tracker is from last conference, you know, to this conference, see which prophecies have been fulfilled. Oh, and yeah. also which ones are going to be fulfilled. And the thing about it is, is that, whoops, prophecy tracker, we didn't have any from last time or this time either. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. surprising. Well, there might be a reason for that. You remember that the world is going to end tomorrow, right? Oh, yeah, tomorrow? I saw that. We didn't mention that at conference at all with the eclipse. There's a great deal yeah. of excitement about that Correct. among faithful Mormons. I'm not kidding. There's a ton. And I thought they might mention something about that, but nothing was said. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Well, in October, you'll have a, a great show with the Prophecy Tracker. That's right. <laughs> They're all <laughs> coming through tomorrow. That's right. Yeah, for sure. Oh, we also had the Seer Tracker where they see around corners and can perceive mm -hmm. hidden truths. And we, if we check that from last conference to this conference, uh, uh, there wasn't any yeah. hidden truths that were brought up that nobody knew about for sure. Uh, and finally, we had the revelation tracker from last time to this time or, or any new revelations. There wasn't any. We have prophet seers and revelators who didn't prophesy, didn't see and didn't reveal anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, that makes me really wonder what is this begs the further question. Does the church actually intend to teach anything new or are we just intent upon repeating the same stuff over and over again? Repetition one, one, is important. <laughs> one thing I saw was just how out of touch they are with yeah. their constituency. Um, you know, when when you're when most of your converts are coming from Africa and you're telling stories about kayaking in in Hawaii and the troubles you had at your uh, two hundred thousand dollar a year uh, law firm uh, problem or getting through law school, uh, I I don't know that you're reaching your target audience at that point. Yeah, for sure. Definitely, for sure. Now, my slides were slightly out of order because Kulch did tweet this out here, and I got it in the correct order this time. He said, I'm excited not to watch a minute in a conference this weekend. Let me know what we're supposed to be outraged about, guys. Thanks. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. He's so funny. We'll and let I, him know. We'll, we'll, we'll let him make the song sure. about it. Yeah. <laughs> now, on Twitter, you get those uh, blues if something's marked safe, and he, he tweeted out that he's marked safe from LDS Journal mm -hmm. Conference today because he didn't watch it. If you get the blue flag, I guess that's when you're safe on Twitter. You're marked okay. Uh, uh, but here is that picture. I did oh, have good. it after all. Here, you guys are uh, you guys are at that swag. What are, where are you guys at yeah. on this? We're at Swig Soda. You can see the sodas behind us. Utah is known for these giant, huge, you know, cups of soda and also sparkling water. There are some healthy things there, but you can't come to Utah and I think Arizona too without going through a drive through and ordering the Founder or the Mango Breeze or something like that. Now, I uh, did text this back to him. I said, you can really see the fallen countenances. It's kind of sad, really, honestly. If you take a look at that, you can literally yeah. just see it right there. <laughs> the and light's he, gone out of us all. Oh. That's what he said. There's darkness in those eyes. And that's why, I, guys, I fixed the picture with you and Colts here. I fixed the picture here. I made it oh. darker. And, uh, I mean, you know, get those oh. countenances fallen a little bit. And I also added a little something extra in there. Oh, you know, yeah, I thought I saw a spirit show up in yeah, there. Yeah, what, what is that? that? Yeah, that's your spirit. Uh, oh, my gosh, it's from the ring. That's terrifying. <laughs> Well, since you guys are Exmos, I figured that would be, you know, four peas in a pod there. I kind of yeah, fixed it no. for you. Is that right? No, you're not. No, you're not we had a out? great time with college. We never smiled or laughed harder. He's <laughs> he's amazing. Yeah, we had a wonderful uh, well, time. I tried to fix it for you. I guess I <laughs> failed here. So this is the conclusion here. General <laughs> disasters, a sort of drama over the past six months. And instead, all we got is a big slap in the face. What do you think? There it is. Yep. Any last takeaways here from the general conference this time, guys? It was a heck of a ride. I tried to give you my sum up the best as I could. I thought it was a, a pretty routine general conference, almost mm -hmm. no surprises whatsoever. Everybody was yeah. uh, drinking the Kool Aid. Everyone is, um, you know, staying in the conformity, and that's what Mormonism is really all about. Is about you know doing what you're supposed to do. Nobody strayed off of the path whatsoever. It was a pretty routine general conference. No surprises whatsoever. They, they did surprise me a little with the uh, nobody from the first presidency was conducting uh, some of the sessions. They were actually 12 apostles because <laughs> evidently none of the first presidency could make it to all through all of the conference uh, sessions. So yeah. uh, I thought that was kind of interesting that they had uh, some of the 12 conducting. Yeah, they had three out of the five sessions that were being conducted by Quorum of the Twelve. Now, my understanding is that has also happened in times past, not in the recent past, but in times before that has happened. So that is not exactly a groundbreaking moment. But yes, that was a slight surprise. But as far as I'm concerned, it was an extremely routine, um, a routine thing. Now, what are you guys working on in the Mormonish podcast in the Good Book Club? What projects do you guys have going on? 
We have so much as usual. No, we have a really interesting episode coming out on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. This is kind of fueled by the whole Charlie Bird scenario where we learned a month or so ago that he and his partner, a wonderful married couple, are attending a ward where they take the sacrament and they're able to hold callings. So we actually gathered together for um, same-sex active LDS couples and we talked to them about their wards. Are they allowed to participate? What can they do? What can't they do? And what's their perspective on all this? So it's a really interesting episode. And this is going to be Tuesday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Sounds absolutely tremendous. Now, what I've got working on is uh, I'm we're doing a watch party for the passage to Zara Hamill. This is based off of the Tennis Shoes Among the Nephites books. It's not exactly based on that, but it's in the same universe. Chris Heimerdinger. This is one heck of a movie. It's part of the Mormon Movie Reviews, and that will premiere tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, I want to thank you guys both so much for coming on to the Mormon News Roundup. I really appreciate it. And while you guys are living a joyful life on the other side of the Mormonism, I just want my viewers to remember that no one held at hand can stop this podcast from progressing so long go take your ties off guys That's right. <laughs>